about writing for something else. Yes, we need. Or maybe you could file for the executive director. <laughs> you could be our executive director. Um, uh, yeah, we could probably sit here all day and ask, ask him questions because he's very knowledgeable. Uh, but we have another speaker, and he actually has a little bit of uh, visual aids with our um, his presentation. Um, so I met this young man. I'm going to say young man because I'm old. Um, I know you're not super young, but you're young compared to me. Um, he spoke down at the county uh, Republican Women uh, County meeting uh, a couple months ago. And he used to be with Project Veritas. He was actually, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the very, very first undercover investigators. Um, and he'll tell you more about that. But I was very impressed with, um, with one, what he does. And I've always wanted to be an undercover investigator. <laughs> 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 I don't think I could go in cognito like we can. Um, but just his, his history, his, his passion for the truth, um, which I think is a lot has, has to do with a lot of the work that they do at these types of organizations. And also, also because of Project Veritas and all the roller coaster rides that it has gone through, I, I think it's wise to hear kind of the, the, the rise and fall as he'll, t as he'll tell you, and some of his war stories. I'm very excited about that. So without further ado, here's Christian Hartzell. my experiences as an undercover journalist, um, but first I'm going to uh, show you a, a, a clue. How many of you know who this is? They don't. The no. Oh, not a clue. Yeah. This is Andrew Breitbart. Yeah. How many of you are familiar, familiar with that name? Yeah. Okay. So, Andrew Breitbart is the one who started the, citizen, the modern citizen journalist movement, and uh, this is uh, one of my favorite memories with him. So I'm going to show you this. I'm the pipe piper. I can't do it all by myself. Every time I go to a tea party or an event like this, I say, okay, guess what? You're appointed, you're in. You're now everyone here. Everyone gives now a journalist and not competing with you for the next job. That's what's happening. If they're not going to report the truth, if they're not going to report the true American narrative, then we're going to do it. And we're going to supplant every network, every anchor, every reporter, and we're going to put them all and banish them on current TV. That's what we're going to do. One by one, we're going to fill up current TV. It's just going to be a network of freaks. The other mode. Christian, say hi to the Nixon Library. Oh yeah, hold on, let me just get them on doing this here. Hey, say hi. Hello, this is Christian Hartsock. Christian, are you a citizen journalist?
she was 23 years old, and Andrew Breitbart uh, took me under his wing. He, uh, and I'm gonna tell you some of my stories with him, and then some uh, one of my stories with Project Veritas. Because the last decade, the decade of 20, 2009, 2023 was the decade that we really waged a guerrilla war in one of the one of the sacred battlefields that has been monopolized by the Democrat media complex uh, for the last century. Now, <clears throat> how many of you remember the the Seinfeld episode about the red dot? Yeah. <laughs> Is it because I told the last time? No, because I've watched Seinfeld probably 50 times every episode. <laughs> so uh, Elaine get, gets George a job, and George, to, to uh, show his appreciation, goes out uh, to the department store and, and, and finds this beautiful cashmere sweater, but it's marked down, it's very, it's very cheap, and he goes, he goes why, why, why is this uh, the price so low? And the woman says, oh, do you see that? You see that red dot on the sleeve? That's why. So he's like, "Well, Elaine will never notice." So he buys the cashmere sweater. He, he he gives it to her, and she freaks out. She's like, "Oh my God! I can't believe you got me this this sweater. This must have cost you a fortune." And then Kramer pops up from the couch and goes, "What's that red dot there?" <laughs> <laughs> Citizen journalists are always after the red dot when the Democrat media complex, the establishment. Did I lose the? I don't know. Sometimes it does that. Hello. Maybe the batteries. Oh, just can you hear me? Wait for it to turn green. Just shout. Oh, it's green. There you go. Testing. Testing. What is it with this media? I don't know. Okay, just talk really loud. Okay. There we go. There we go. The establishment produces a, beer, a beautiful cashmere sweater, but it's up to the citizen and the mainstream media, CBS, ABC, PBS, NPR, New York Times, Washington Post, they all say, oh, look at this cashmere sweater. But the citizen, it's up to the citizen journalist to find the red dot. <clears throat> now, exactly one week from today will be the 60th anniversary of the great, the first greatest act of citizen journalism in American history. Now, every single news outlet, every single news outlet was assembled in Dealey Plaza on November 22nd, 1963. Everyone was there, all the, the mainstream media was there, but it was a hat salesman by the, by the name of Abraham Zabruder who got the real scoop with his eight millimeter camera. Now, that eight millimeter film would sit under lock and key in a Time Life magazine vault for the next several years and wouldn't be seen by the citizenry uh, until not, I think, six years later in a New Orleans courtroom. But once that eight millimeter film got out to the public, everyone said, what is that red dot there? Back into the left, back into the left, and that transformed the nature of the of the paradigm of the relationship between the public and the government and that sacred trust for the next century for the next half century now later in 2011 uh a little later in 2011 this is before you guys' time but there was this, this uh, revolt in the wisconsin legislature some of you may have may recall Scott Walker had passed the uh, budget repair bill and the Democrats flipped out. There were 14 Democrat legislators who disappeared and went AWOL uh, so that the, they wouldn't have a legislative quorum. And before, before there was Antifa, there was Occupy. Mm -hmm. And before there was MAGA, there was the Tea Party. So you had uh, these Occupy Wall Street uh, under the Occupy Columbus chapter organized and they swarmed the capital of Wisconsin. They set up camps, they, they, they literally occupied it. You, you almost call it an insurrection. <laughs> uh, for an entire, yeah. And, and so I flew out there and I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I sat in on some of the international socialist organization meetings. 
because I want to find because the way the mainstream media was reporting it is look, you know the 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 the, the, the workers, the organic. teachers, these pardon. This organic group. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the work these, you know these union this union busting governor Scott Walker Coke funded is is busting these unions and and these, you know these brave teachers and hard workers are, are standing up and 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 rally. I, I want to find out what the red dog was, which was, what is their actual plan? These socialists admitted, many of them admitted socialists, what is their actual plan for, what, what, how, would, how, how did they want to run things? So I went into the Capitol and I just, this was back in the day where we didn't need undercover cameras, we just needed a friendly face and Everyone, you know, it's the Pauline Kale complex. They'll assume that you're on their side as long as you're friendly. <coughs> so I interviewed this kid, Rob Lewis, and I asked him, uh, so why are you here? Why are you occupying the Wisconsin Capitol? And he said, well, because the capitalists are trying to take away from the workers. And I said, okay, so uh, tell me about how, how have you experienced this? How have you seen this firsthand? And he said, well, I work at a restaurant called Noodles. And basically it's a dictatorship. And I said, oh, okay, well, well tell me, how is Noodles a dictatorship? And he goes, well, you have to show up. <laughs> You're told what to cook and when to cook it, and if you don't do it right, you might be fired. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I said, okay, well, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that sounds terrifying. Uh, so tell me, if you were running noodles, using noodles as a, a microcosm of America, how would you run noodles? And he said, well, we would all be equals. All the workers would be equals. And we would decide what to cook and when to cook it. Oh. I said, okay, well, what about the founder? Does he have a say in this? And he goes, oh, well, sure. We would, we would invite the, the founder of noodles to a seat at the table. Uh, but he would have to agree to sit down as an equal amongst all of us. And I looked up uh, the founder of Noodles, Aaron Kennedy, this guy named Aaron Kennedy, who, when he was a kid, he, he, he maxed out, he, 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 he had an idea for a franchise. He was in a Chinese restaurant, and he wrote a, his business plan on a napkin, and then went out and, uh, and maxed out all his credit cards, uh, risked relationships with family and friends to borrow money and then started Noodles employing up to 3,000, 30,000 workers just like Rob Lewis. If these people had their way, he would be forced out of business it would, and he would be forced to sit down as an equal, right? These are, and it occurred to me having sat in on this, on this, uh, gone undercover in this ISO meeting that Rob Lewis didn't come up with these ideas. These are 200-year-old ideas. That's the red dot. And so we released that tape. Andrew Breitbart was a big fan of the noodles. And, uh, and it ended up on Glenn Beck on Fox News, and it, it was a very viral sensation. Now, uh, fast forward uh, a few years. I'm working with Prodnit. Andrew Breitbart died uh, very suddenly. And I was the last to see him in the office the night he died. And erstwhile, I had been working with James O'Keefe. Uh, James O'Keefe had discovered me in 2009. He'd seen a, a trailer for my thesis film. He was very impressed with me. Production values, he wanted me to shoot uh, this acorn, the uh, B-roll for this acorn investigation that he was doing with Hannah Giles. How many of you remember acorn? Yeah, so Hannah and James pretended to be a pimp and prostitute, went into Acorn offices saying they want to help uh, set up a brothel for 14-year-old Salvadoran sex slaves, and the Acorn workers are saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you want to list them as dependents. <laughs> and don't say prostitution, say performing arts. And that, with Andrew Breitbart publishing it on biggovernment.com, that was... That was the shot heard around the world. President Obama, former ACORN lawyer, was forced to sign, uh, sign legislation defunding ACORN because the videos were so damning. <clears throat> so I'm working with James. Uh, it's uh, fast forward to 2019. 
and it's a year before the election. Now, we had, we had a whistleblower named Zach Voorhees came, came forward. He wor was working for Google, and he released to us documents uh, exposing this machine learning algorithm. Uh, algorithm. And we had another in insider in Google who was confirming that there was something called machine learning fairness, which was a program that Google was using to, to manipulate the search results. Now, it was a little benign as far as we could see. If you Googled, if you Googled, uh, if you Googled CEO, you would see a, uh, a bunch of women CEO, even though women comprise a, a, you know, a fraction of actual CEOs. If you Googled famous inventors, it would all be inventors of color. Then you wouldn't see Alexander Hamilton. You wouldn't see Alexand Alexander Graham Bell. We, uh, we want to find out how far this went. What is the red dot? What, what are they using this for political purposes? So we have to find out, okay, who's going to tell us on in camera? We can't just ask them. They'll say, oh, of course we're not doing that. We have to go undercover and find out. So just as Rob Lewis probably wouldn't have told me his little plan for noodles <laughs> <laughs> had, I, had I been a self-identified reporter. So. I, who's, the, who's the head of machine learning fairness? I Google it. It's this woman, Jen Janai. And she's an Irish American woman in San Francisco. And, you know, woke, you know, total, uh, you know, want, wants to be liked at cocktail parties. What, uh, what's a way to get in front of her? So we come up with this charity, Two Step Solutions. And I, I reach out to her and I say, Dear Ms. Janai, you are a very successful, inspiring woman in tech. We are a charity that is matching in, inspiring female mentors with young girls of color because we want to disabuse society of this notion that, that tech is a boys game and we, and we want to get young girls interested in technology at a young age. And also, this is a reparative program because you have to admit, Jen, that the tech boom has forced a lot of minority communities into the excerpts, Hayward, San Leandro, uh, Oakland. So we're doing this with young girls of color in particular, <clears throat> so, we can, so we can get those communities involved in, in the tech sector early on. And she, she, she writes back and says, ooh, this is lovely, I, I love this idea. <laughs> so yes, when can we meet? Um, well, but actually she says, first, can we Skype? So I said, oh, okay. Yeah, so we had to go up to San Francisco, rent a WeWork space, do a bunch of set design, okay? <laughs> Just for the backdrop of the Zoom meeting, we got a white, we got props, we got a whiteboard, we put, you know, put it on the wall, we, we put picture, pictures of kids and pictures of adults and, and arrows and, you know, so, 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 so it looked legit. And we had, you know, unwitting extras in the back in the WeWork space. Uh, so, uh, we have we have a uh, meeting with her about five minutes. All just just we go to all that trouble spending all day to do all this production design just to just to justify the five minute Skype meeting. So, but the real goal was to get in front of her. Well, uh, we did some digging on her Instagram. Where where where's a food restaurant that she's checked in? There was a cantina in the Mission. So I thought, okay. So when once she we talked to her and she found out, okay, they're human beings, they're normal. She said, okay, great. I will meet with you. And I said, okay. Well, how about this cantina in the Mission? She's like, oh, I love that place. I'm like, oh, no way. <laughs> so so uh, I take her out to dinner at this cantina, and. <clears throat> We talk a little, talk a little shop, but then I, I, I close my notebook and I'm like, all right, Jen, what happened in 2016? Who dropped the ball? Thank <laughs> God that Silicon Valley, uh, you know, is a liberal uh, blue area and that this, this industry, ha this industry has, has come out of a blue uh, culture. But with great power comes great responsibility, Jen. What what is doing? What is being done? What happened? She's like, oh yes, don't worry, don't worry. We are working overtime to prevent another Trump situation in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> all about that. Well, and then she starts telling me how that. And this was in 2019, 
okay? This was way before COVID. She's telling me how they're, they're making sure that the anti-vaxxers are not appearing in search results. She's making sure that only, only certain news media uh, appears in the search results and, and that, uh, that certain fact checkers appear in the search results. And she told, told me all about this. So anyway, we get that on tape and then uh, we release it about a week later and YouTube bans the video. I don't know what they had against it, <laughs> uh, but they banned the video. But fortunately, by the time they had done that, Donald Trump Jr. had already tweeted the embed code for the video. And that video ended up being one of our most viral videos to date at the time. Uh, Senator Cruz happened to be, have, there, there happened to be a committee hearings with Google executives on the House and Senate floors that day, and Senator Cruz was reading a transcript from my dinner with Jen Janai to the faces of Google executives. <laughs> President Trump was in the Oval Office and he had a press gaggle that was, of course, you know, wanting, probably wanting to give him the third degree about Russia or whatever, and he said, no, 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 what we're gonna talk about today is this video. I want all you to, forcing them to report on the video. <laughs> Now that is the power of videotape. That is, that is the revolution that we led, that we pioneered back in 2009, and that is the reason we, have, we had a much more informed electorate over the last decade, is because we had these tools, we had these courageous undercover journalists that, that I led with this tradecraft that James O'Keefe pioneered and that Andrew Breitbart popularized. And because of that, we were able to wage a culture war on a sacred battlefield that had long been monopolized by the left for the past century. So, yeah. so I have a, I have a few more minutes. So so I'll, I'll take qu any questions anyone has. What are you working on now? <laughs> Sorry. Well, I could tell you. Well, that was a part of my question. Well, I can tell you, uh, Project Veritas is no more. Uh, it just ended a few months ago, and uh, so there's this diaspora of very talented, the most talented investigative journalists in the world, uh, many of whom are out of a job and looking for a new home. Uh, I encourage you to, to, fo to follow them. Uh, uh, Alyssa Dean on Twitter, Bobby Har on Twitter is doing uh, some some fantastic work exposing the, the homeless crisis. Arden Young, uh, who just did a story with Sound Investigations, which was actually founded by one by a whistleblower, a Pinterest whistleblower for PV, that uh, Eric Cochran, who I who I managed around that same time, 2019. And so Arden Young, Alyssa Dean, Bobby Har, Gavin Elwes has a very fun Twitter account, um, and uh, uh, James Lolino. So, uh, so I encourage you guys to follow some of these PV veterans. They're the most talented people that I ever had the pleasure of, of work, of mentoring, of leading, and of working with. Yeah. So now that there's kind of this vacuum, mm -hmm. right, uh, without Project Veritas, and without, I don't know what James is up to. I know he started something else and I'm not sure what that, the status of that is. I certainly don't hear about it as much. Do you think that that's, that's a whole, uh, that's a vacuum that someone like you could start something anew and I have form a new uh, organization to bring these people together and continue on instead of just having them kind of out there? Yeah, well, there's, there's certainly some there's, there's, there's certainly a lot of talk of that, of okay. forming something new, whether it's a, you know, a, a, a constellation of new organizations or, or one new organization. Uh, but yeah, that is certainly something that, that a lot of us are talking about. And so you know, it's still fresh, and so we're, we're, we're yeah. seeing what, what's, what's on the horizon. Um, I was going to say that um, I did see that James O'Keefe had started um, yeah. something else new <coughs> on Truth and he's asking people to um, just bring down equipment and do whatever. There are a lot of new startup companies that, but that need to be funded, you know? Um, I have one, mine is called America's Agenda. <laughs> America's but, Agenda. Yeah. Okay. So um, that, that's one that you want to tell people about. Awesome. <laughs> Every, everyone check 
out America's agenda. I have one more, sorry, one more question. Tell us about how you almost got um, outed. Oh, so this is, uh, well, it happened a number of times. It's sort of an occupational hazard of being an undercover journalist. Uh, so Lauren knows this story where I was undercover in, on Treasure Island in uh, San Francisco on Jan at, at this, this ball that was being held by every single left wing, almost every single left wing group in the Bay Area. And there, there are one or two left wing groups. <laughs> <laughs> one or two. <laughs> Uh, so, almost anyone who was anyone in, le in, in liberal politics, Democrat politics, in Northern California was there. Anyway, I had been burrowing my way into this organization called the California League of Conservation Voters. And the reason I was doing that was I, we didn't really care about them. It was their Rolodex. This is the people they were connected to. Eric Holder, Kevin DeLeon, um, and the, you know, the, the, the former Obama people. So we really were using them as what's called an access agency to get access to these other people that they would introduce us to. Anyway, so I had thus far uh, been networking with you know the political director and some, some of the some of the top brass, but I was going to be introduced that night to Sarah Rose, who was the the CEO or founder of CLCV, and it was a big deal for me to be introduced to her. So I had my contact, my CLCV contact, who was, and my name was, um, my name was Trent Maynard. That was my, that was my alias. And I grew up in the Bay Area, by the way. I grew up in Oakland. And <clears throat> I live in LA now, but, but I was traveling up there for the trip. Anyway, so, so my contact was about to introduce me to Sarah Rose, who was the HNIC, the, 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 the boss, the big boss. And this was a big deal for me for me to be introduced to her. So anyway, she says, um, so Trent, uh, this is, so Sarah, or no, no, she says, Sarah, this is, and then I'm about to, I'm about to shake her hand and she, and I hear this voice, Christian Hartsock behind me. And I'm, I'm I, I just try to ignore it. And I'm like, hi, I'm Trent. And then I hear it again, Christian Hartsock. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and then I look, and there's Elon Cohen, who I went to third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, all the way through twelfth grade with. <laughs> and and I, I and I look over at him. Every Sarah looks at him. My contact looks at him, and there was the, the entire you know the DJ went <laughs> <laughs> the entire room of twenty thousand people. Just all the heads whipped over to me. It was like in the bus and planes trains. <laughs> Someone actually dropped a pin. I don't know. <laughs> like you could hear it. <laughs> Everyone's looking at me. And 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 then my contact says, Oh no, no, no. This is this is this is Trent, Trent Maynard. And then Elon's looking at me and goes, you look a lot like a guy I grew up with named Christian Hartsock. Oh, and I said, oh, must be a good looking guy, I guess. <laughs> and he goes, I almost don't believe you that you're not Christian Hartsock. <laughs> and then everyone's looking at me and he goes, but he works for Breitbart. He wouldn't be here. And then everyone laughs and then I, I meet Sarah and everything's fine. <laughs> so, so.